The Arctic food web goes something like this. The lowest and most abundant form of life are the viruses and the bacteria. They may look a little like long lost galaxies on an astronomical plate, but these are the food and vitamin pills for other organisms. Phytoplankton or microalgae, like these Fragilariopsis, are the plant life of the Arctic Ocean. They're eaten by zooplankton, the smallest animals of the Arctic seas, like this copepod. Some of the strange creatures floating around are both plant and animal, like this radiolarian. Then it's up to the fish, seals and polar bears at the very top. But science understands this web only poorly. We know all these organisms, plant and animal life forms, lock away carbon as they excrete and die. But whether it's Peter with his deep sea mud creatures, Arlene with her ice cores, or Stig and his nets, they're all doing the same thing, trying to identify, count and understand parts of the web to figure out how it works and how climate change might affect it. If you looked at viruses in terms of carbon, um, the amount of viruses in the world's ocean are the equivalent of 75 million blue whales. So there's a lot of carbon there tied up in bacteria and viruses. They're important because they're at the base of the food web and they're really key to recycling all the carbon and nutrients that are being used by organisms further up the food web. Out on deck, Henrik and his landers could help build up a picture of that web by pulling sediment up from the seabed. It can be very, uh, quite, quite a dramatic uh, uh, yeah. bathymetry. It's a bit like a moon landing, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. You're finding the right place. Yeah, actually, that's, that's why they're called landers, basically. When the algae die, or the zooplankton die, they sink down to the seafloor where it provides the food source for all the animals and, and microbes living, living in the seafloor. Part of it uh, is, is actually buried in the sediment and kind of uh, locked away over ge geological timescales. We can calculate how much is actually uh, recycled within the sediment and goes back to the water column again and how much is, is locked away in the sediment and that's important. The Arctic Ocean is a good place to start because it's changing so fast it's a bellwether for what might happen to the rest of our oceans. And they matter because the startling fact is that the oceans, or more correctly the life forms that live in them, account for about half of all the absorption by the planet of the carbon dioxide circulating through the atmosphere. If we disturb that so-called carbon sink, then the world could be in even bigger trouble. So how many expeditions have you been Ray summed up the key questions the team set out with and the questions they've come back with. We're interested to know how much carbon is leaving the plants and entering the bacteria. The plants are producing a lot of carbon, but the bacteria aren't and usually taking it up. And this leads to two questions. If the plants aren't taking up that dissolved carbon, where is it going? And also, what is fueling bacterial activity? Now, we don't know the answer to those questions yet. Um, some of our data may, may give us further clues, but it really shows the sort of the, the basic state of our knowledge in this area. Um, this is a fundamental part of the carbon cycle which we really don't understand yet. And it's not just the food web that's throwing up questions. Just last year new research suggested that when ice itself forms at the poles it sends carbon down into the deep oceans, possibly at such a rate that it matches the amount of carbon we hope to save by enforcing the Kyoto Protocol. Okay what we're really interested in here is being able to predict the effect of global warming, climate change, disappearance of sea ice on the Arctic marine ecosystem. To do this we need to run simulation models of how that ecosystem may change but those models are only as good as the information that they're based upon. To make sense of the present and to predict the future scientists need to understand the past more clearly but there's very little historical data at all about the Arctic environment and the creatures that live in it. James is a paleoclimatologist. He's looking for chemical markers linked to bacteria and algae in the sea ice. When the organisms die and sink to the sea floor and decay, the biomarkers are left behind and are preserved as a kind of uh, molecular fossil in ocean sediments. Um, and what I'm really interested in is if we can 
identify biomarkers which are unique to sea ice, and then we can find them in ocean sediments going back thousands or millions of years. We can use them to reconstruct the presence of sea ice or absence of sea ice at a particular place in time over geological timescales. Um, and that can give us a, a real insight into natural processes of uh, climate change in the Arctic. Back at the Nyarlathotep polar base, there's no more time for experiments. It's the end of the voyage, they're unloading the ship and all the science has finished. And what may prove to be the most valuable part of this trip is that it's turned out to be a perfect baseline year, both for the ice and for the plants and animals that live in the Arctic Ocean. And the reason that's important is that the scientists can use all the data they've gathered against which to measure future changes. It is something of a race against time. This particular part of the Arctic this year has been cold and icy, but the Arctic is getting warmer. The rest of the Arctic this year has been fairly warm. So we only have a fairly small window of opportunity in which to, to study true Arctic ecosystems before the big changes start taking effect. Ray and his team face months of painstaking analysis of all those thousands of slides and samples of seafloor sediment and Arctic ice to make sense of what they found. But time is not on their side. If you'd even took five years ago, most scientists were predicting an ice-free Arctic around the end of this century. Only three years ago that was reduced to 2040 and now scientists are talking an ice-free Arctic in summer in the next decade. With the Arctic summer drawing to a close, the pace of change is quickening. And whatever happens to the Arctic ice over the coming decade or so, making sense of what that means for life here is vital to understanding the changes yet to come in oceans elsewhere. And that matters to all of us. Susan Watts reporting. You can see Susan's blog on her Arctic adventure on the website.